Okay, good morning, Monday. I'm Jay Fidel, this is Think Tech, more specifically, this is Global Connections uh, with uh, Michael Michael Davis, who joins us from Washington, New York. Did yeah. I get that right? Joins us from New York, okay. And uh, Michael taught for years at the Hong Kong University, um, and he's a senior fellow at the Woodrow Wilson International Center, and he's a, a professor and faculty at the Jindal University in India. Uh, good morning, Michael. Nice to see your smiling yeah. face. So we want to talk about Hong good Kong morning. today because uh, you lived there and worked there and taught there and you saw it up close for many years and you still follow it closely today. You speak hither and yon about it. You write about it. Um, and you must be concerned. About it. <laughs> right. Yeah. You, you must I be. I just wrote a book about it. So, so uh, yeah. What was the name of the book and where can I get it? Well, uh, it's called Making Hong Kong, China, The Rollback of Human Rights and the Rule of Law, Columbia University Press. And you just Google Making Hong Kong, China, and, and it'll come up. And uh, then it, it shows you how to order. It's actually rather cheap because we wanted it for wide readership. So I think it's about 15 bucks. Oh, that's great. OK. Well, can we, can we um, get into what's going on there? It just seems. Every time I look or every, every time I hear, every time I get a news, newsletter, email, what have you, things are worse in Hong Kong. Am I right? That's the truth. And, and especially in the last couple of years, since the protest in 2019, uh, things have gone down very much. Uh, there's, a, a, I think, an attitude in the government that, well, look at all the protests in 2019. What, no country is going to tolerate that. And now there's, there's arguing they that only patriots should be running for office. And of course, arguing, well, every country wants their polit politicians to be patriots. Uh, but in the context of Hong Kong, patriot means something different than it does here. Here, you can be a patriot and oppose the government. There, uh, the people that oppose the government then are being held not to be patriots. And I, I know that's one of the reasons we're talking today, because a bunch of them were arrested, yeah. Yeah, the 47 most recently, on top of others before, all under that new security law a few months old now. And uh, it's it's pretty scary because these guys are they're civilized, educated, thoughtful. They're legitimate democratic protesters uh, or media like Jimmy Lai. And uh, gee whiz, he's really, he meaning Xi Jinping is really going after them ruining their lives, making them miserable, completely miserable. How would you like to carry that around all day? Well, you can imagine if in Hawaii, if you imagined all the most popular political leaders all being arrested at once and told they're a threat to the nation's security uh, just for participating in a primary election, then you get an idea of what we're talking about. That's essentially uh, over many, many years, when there's only a limited number of seats in the Legislative Council, about half of them, that have been directly elected over the years. And uh, the opposition camp under the system, the way it's designed, would often lose seats because uh, whoever got the most votes would get the seat. And if two opposition candidates ran against each other, then uh, they they would erase each other and, and the pro-government guy would get, might get the seat. So with the design of trying to actually get a majority, even though all these years they've won about 60% of the vote, 55, 60% of the vote uh, in the popular vote, that is not uh, narrow constituencies, but in direct elections. And yet they would always hold about one third of the seats because the system was kind of rigged against them half the seats being chosen by what's called functional sectors. So they got the clever idea. One of my colleagues at Hong Kong U, in fact, led in creating this a guy named Benny Tai, uh, a professor who was recently dismissed. Uh, he got the idea last July of having a primary election uh, so that they could uh, choose among the opposition camp who would be the candidate in different districts for, for election. Uh, something very familiar to you in Hawaii, because of course you have primary elections there. Uh, and we know that sometimes they can be very competitive in a lot of debate and so on. So this, in this case, they had it. 
and there are 610,000 people participating in. They organized it themselves. And the idea was that they could win enough seats, then they could control uh, the government. And uh, they, some of them had the idea under the basic law of Hong Kong that if they block the budget, uh, that then the chief executive have to resign and there'd have to be a new selection. So they're basically uh, behaving like politicians everywhere, trying to win and to <laughs> control the government in a system that doesn't allow them to take charge of the government. So they were all in a primary election and Beijing, uh, right, this was right after the national security law was passed on, on June 30th last year in, in July. And Beijing was already saying, well, this primary election is subversion, one of the crimes under the national security law. Uh, but everybody kind of, you know, how can that be subversion? All they're doing is having a primary election. Any case, uh, that that stench was left in the air. And then month, year, months, I guess, many months later, the next year, in fact, uh, just recently in January, they uh, were all arrested suddenly. 55 of them were arrested. Everyone who participated in the primary election was arrested. And, uh, that, and, and recently they had a bail hearing, right? And right. one third of them got bail. The rest of them are still in, in, in jail. So what happened is in Hong Kong, you'd be arrested. Then you have to be brought before the court to be charged. And that was done uh, last Sunday. They were told, even though in January they said they wouldn't be called back until May, they suddenly decided to speed it up. Now, there's a footnote here. Speed it up. Why? Because they're going to have meetings in Beijing and they want to, you know, get these guys in court and charge them with crimes uh, as a prelude to the politics that's going on in Beijing. So in any case, they, they were all brought in Sunday, last Sunday, uh, not the one that just passed yesterday, but the week before, uh, and told them to come back on Monday. They would be charged. 47 of the 55 were, were charged. And then uh, under the, the new national security law, something really uh, horrible occurs uh, because under that law, it creates a presumption against granting bail. Now, if you your, your listeners know anything about bail, they know that the idea is that people are innocent until proven guilty. That's the basis on which in the common law, which applies in Hong Kong and Hawaii, the common law principle that you're innocent until proven guilty, so you should be let off on bail unless you pose a danger to society in some way. And so that was the Hong Kong rule. And you mentioned Jimmy Lai earlier, that rule was overturned because Jimmy Lai, the high court let him off on bail under very strict conditions. He's a very famous publisher in Hong Kong of the most widely read newspaper. Uh, and he was charged with also with subversion and with collusion with foreigners uh, because he prints his ideas in newspapers and, and uh, speaks to foreign press and criticizes the national security law. So almost all the people charged under this national security law, over 100 now, are charged with speaking crimes. Uh, only one, as far as I know, actually did something violent. And that was on the first day of the law, a guy ran his motorcycle into to a, a cordon of police with signs on his motorcycle. But otherwise, almost everybody charged is charged with just something about speaking or freedom of speech. Uh, and so Jimmy Lai was granted bail during Christmas and then the government appealed it and the bail was with, withdrawn. Um, and and uh, well, the government appealed it directly to the court of final appeal. And when it, it did so, uh, when the court agreed to hear the case, they put him back in jail. And then when he finally issued its ruling, they, they ruled that based on the language of the national security law that there's a presumption against bail and that the defendant has to show us why you get bail. So this is why you were hearing about it in the news because now we got 47 people having to show that they pose no risk of committing these crimes. And it's interesting, you listen to the government, the government call, calls them all dangerous people. You know, they're dangerous because the national security law is a law for subversion. You can be sentenced from three years to life in prison. 
Okay, and there's gradients under the law about which one should be given life in prison and so on. So the government prosecutes national security offenders as if they're murderers and they're a danger to society for speaking. For in this case, doing nothing more, the only charge relates to having a primary. And so, by the way, they the, are brought the, the into one court third of, the one third of them uh, that did get bail. The yeah. one third, and I think it was really token, you know, uh, that did get bail. The government appealed all of those cases. They appealed yeah. the granting of bail. They want them all in jail. Right. And so they were all returned to jail. But why it wound up in your evening news a lot is because it took four days of hearings. Why? Because the defendants, instead of the government having to prove they are risk to society, the defendants had to put on as best case they could to try to convince the court that they should be released on bail. And so you can imagine, under the national security law, they have to convince the court they're not going to violate the national security law. But the national security law is so vague that no one knows what's a violation of the national security law. The government keeps making it up as it goes along. So you have a bunch of defendants and a judge who don't even know what is a violation of the national security law in its totality. And they're all trying to show that they pose no risk of doing that. And so that's why four people were hauled off to the hospital during these hearings because they, they fell ill from exhaustion uh, as four dependents. Uh, and so it was a horrendous experience. And, and so then you're right. Eventually, uh, all of them were denied bail except for 15. And then the government immediately appealed that court and so the 15 were sent back to jail as well. So all 47 were sent back to jail. And then a day or two later, the government says, well, we won't pursue the appeal against four of them. So four of them did eventually get released. But this is a kind of intimidation. When we look at something like this, we have to look beyond. It's not just 47 people whose rights are at risk. When these kinds of things are, do, are taking place, Virtually anyone who opposes the government will understand that opposing the government is risky. And, and so that's the way free speech is. You don't have to arrest all the journalists. You don't have to arrest all the politicians. You just have to arrest enough of them to send a message to the rest. And that's People in Hong Kong must be terrified. In Hong Kong too. They must be terrified. The average person, uh, the average person who might speak even to his, his, you know, his close circle must be terrified. Uh, that he also can be dragged into court. He also uh, can be exposed to a long sentence, which presumably for a lot of them will be carried out in mainland China, uh, far away from friends and family and in uh, and, and, and retraining and, and, and prison camps that will be very, very unpleasant and, and really end their lives as they have known their lives. Well, see, this is what we don't know. Now, the security law itself, uh, one of the uh, several of the provisions near the end create an office for safeguarding national security, which is staffed by members of the mainland public security bureau and state security officers. Uh, and this office can, if it judges a case to be, and this is quoting from the law complex, can transfer the case to be tried on the mainland, where virtually, all, of course, all rights go out the window, even uh, any courageous judge's effort to protect rights would not be uh, part of the case. So that, that could happen. In fact, when Jimmy Lai's case, that first time that the case was sent on this bail issue to the highest court in Hong Kong, there was a big article in the People's Daily that in a very veiled sort of way seemed to suggest, well, if you guys in the court of final, Jimmy Lai, they said, is a dangerous individual. And if you guys don't get it right, well, one thing we can do under the national security law, we have the ultimate power of interpretation. So we can overrule you on the one hand. But also I think there was a kind of veiled threat. Well, we may take Jimmy Lai to the mainland. So you can imagine no matter how uh, good a common law judges are in Hong Kong, they're going to feel the heat. Do we uh, rule against the government and then risk having this taken out of our hands entirely? 
or do we have to try to go along to get along? Uh, so there's a kind of pressure to be very strategic, which, which judges in any authoritarian regime uh, who are committed to justice pretty much have to do if they don't want to be slapped down and dismissed entirely from the process or have the process taken over by the hardliners in the regime. So this, you know, whether the courts can defend rights in Hong Kong is not going to be just, you know, about the good intentions of judges and their commitment to justice. It's going to involve their need to calculate the risks they in, will encounter and what is best for the society they're trying to protect. <laughs> they're being compromised. The whole system is being compromised. Can you, can you talk about other things that the... Uh, that the, you know, the Chinese government is doing to limit freedoms, to limit the rule of law, to limit democratic process in Hong Kong? Well, you know, what I've talked about so far tells you how many institutions are under threat. So our conversation so far, we know that the chief executive is always beholden to Beijing. So that institution is not going to be up to defending Hong Kong's autonomy. Uh, when it comes to the legislature, before what they did this week, and I'm going to—I know your question goes to what they're doing this week. Before that, Beijing had already authorized the dismissal of four members of the opposition camp from the legislature for their that they were not patriotic enough because they were opposing the national security law. And when the uh, Beijing authorized it, the Hong Kong government promptly dismissed the four, and then all the opposition camp resigned from the legislative council. So now the legislative council, according to Carrie Lam, she's very happy with it now. She can really do business there because nobody opposes her. So that's kind of what's, what happened already. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, Beijing wants to fix their problems for long term. So what they did is during the same week, they declared in this meeting going on in, in Beijing of the National People's Congress, they, they alerted us that they were going to amend the annexes to the basic law of Hong Kong that talk about how the political system will function uh, until you know there's full democracy, which of course now seems like it'll never occur. And so they're going to amend it. And they we haven't seen the final text yet because there's still going on up there, but we've been alerted to what is planned. And so in the past, the Legislative Council had, uh, you know, I guess 70 members uh, and 35 of them were directly elected in some form and 35 were kind of functional sectors. Well, Beijing is going to expand it to 90. Every time Beijing wants to talk about being more democratic, it just wants to increase the number of heads in the room. It's not going to uh, actually increase who chooses the people to get in the room. In fact, what they're doing now, well, up until now, uh, given that the Democrats will not, the, the opposition will not win every single directly elected seat, they've been able to hold on in the past to uh, over one third of the seats, which gave them the ability to block legislation, not to pass it. OK, uh, and so that was their their the only power they had to push back in the legislature. But now Beijing's going to increase it to 90 and it's going to take out the votes of the, that used to come from the district council, which was five of the seats. And then it's going to have these pro Beijing groups, uh, including uh, Hong Kongers who sit in the national parliaments to then choose or to be a part of the Legislative Council, so that basically the, the pan-democrats, even if they could run, will never be able to get that one third again. But of course, that my even if actually matters, because what they're also doing is they're going to increase the election committee that chooses the chief executive. It's been 1,200, they're going to make it 1,500, and again, pile on all the pro-Beijing people they can uh, to increase the number, not to increase the people who vote for the members of that committee. And now that committee is not going to just choose the chief executive. It's going to vet every candidate that's running for the legislative council. So it's going to start functioning like the guardian council in Iran to vet for patriotism all candidates that run for the legislative council. So the pan-democratic people in Hong Kong who are not in jail, there are not too many of them, 
but the ones that are not in jail have been interviewed by the press. And of course they say, well, there's no way I'll be able to run for this office. So we don't know whether Hong Kong's reaction will be to, to boycott these elections when they finally take place. One of the other things they've done, they had already delayed the Legislative Council elections by a year uh, last year. That, that primary election was to choose candidates to run last September for the Legislative Council. Well, they not only condemned the primary election and threw four members out of LegCo last year, but they also delayed the election for a year. Now, in last night's press conference, there's hints they're going to delay it further. Uh, and so it starts looking a lot like Myanmar's approach to democracy uh, now. And, and it's been a lot, it's a big concern. It's not just a concern for Hong Kong people, but it's a concern for everyone who relied on prom the promises China made to Hong Kong. And I think for a lot of us who just care about Hong Kong, because Hong Kong is it's like New York. London, it, Paris, it's one of the great cities of the world. And it's been such an extraordinary place for China to have such an asset that, that is in the first league of the world cities. Uh, and now it's all these things are happening. Now, I wonder where is all leading us? I'm sure that would be your next question. Well, what, one of the questions I wanted to ask is, yeah. what about the, you know, tell you where it would lead me. I'd be trying to get out of there. I mean, because, you know, it's, it's, the walls are closing in um, and there were some, you know, allocated uh, visas uh, by the UK to allow Hong Kongers to uh, come to the UK. But but I understand that that program is in jeopardy. What's going on with that? Can I get out? Yeah, well, that's it. You just said one of the solutions, if you can't go along with all of this, somehow submit to everything Beijing's doing to control Hong Kong is exit. Exit is of course a, a tried and tested thing. That's why we have such uh, ex you know passionate debates in America over refugees and admissions of people into the country because people uh, have to exit if they, they can't change the government in any way and the government is a danger to society. Well, Britain was really forthcoming because it said that sort of roughly half the population of Hong Kong could come to Britain because these were all people who hold what's called a British National Overseas Passport, which was given to Hong Kongers when Hong Kong was handed over. It didn't in the past give them the right to stay in Britain, but only to stay for, uh, I think, six months or something. But now Britain has said all those BNO passport holders and their families can come to Britain. Now, Beijing is trying to threaten that, trying to block people from exiting in some ways or threaten to do so. But so far, I think they, you, they can still apply for this visa if they're, one of the things that, that seemed to be needed at first was they actually had the BNO passport and not simply that they were entitled to it. But I think Britain relaxed that so, all, so that Beijing couldn't block them by blocking them from getting the BNO passport. So Britain is prepared to give visas to all these people. And I think a great thing for Britain, Hong Kong people are so industrious and after Brexit in England, it's probably they could use a few, uh, <laughs> you know, good entrepreneurs to come to town. So I think they would, they, they would benefit greatly from having Hong Kong people come there. But China, it, it's, kind of, um, it's hard to figure out whether China wants this or not. I mean, obviously it would lose a big talent poll if people started all going to Britain. I think even Carrie Lam, the government chief executive of Hong Kong, I think her, her husband is even a British national, if, I, if I'm not mistaken. But uh, I'm just uh, some, uh, somewhere I heard that. Well, it all sounds, yeah, pretty, so it all sounds pretty oppressive. And, uh, you know, and what, one has to wonder um, why. It's a huge, big, looming question. Why? Why? I guess the uh, the People's Congress are happening right now in Beijing, and um, it must be it must have some political connection with that, and uh, with uh, Xi Jinping's uh, aspirations to get another five year term and to be the biggest guy on the block. Um, you know wh what is the why here? Why is China being so tough on Hong Kong? Well, I think there's a number of factors at play. We can take our pick. I think one is Xi Jinping is kind of a tough guy. He, he's uh, taken a very hard line approach to rule in Hong in China generally. He arrested 
defense lawyers. He's gone after all minority groups that uh, he views as some kind of security threat in Xinjiang and Tibet and, and Mongolia, even uh, imposing uh, Chinese language uh, on people who speak a Mongolian, a Mongol language or, or other languages, the Uyghur languages and so on. Uh, so all of that is part of what's going on. Uh, and of course, there's a, there a claim, well, look at Hong Kong. It was a big mess in 2019. No country would tolerate this according to the Chinese official statements. Uh, and so we're gonna clean up this mess. There's no regard to the fact that they caused it, that the people were protesting because they weren't carrying out their commitments under the sign of British treaty and the basic law. It wasn't like Hong Kong people just got up one day and decided they were gonna wreak havoc on the streets of Hong Kong, but they had spent years protesting and, and con you know, and, and trying to persuade Beijing to carry out its commitments to Hong Kong and, and seeing more and more Beijing interference in Hong Kong's autonomy. So there was a reason for the protest, but rather than address the reason, you know, they want to crack down. Now that, that raises another reason, that, another answer to your question, which is really, I, I think part of the problem is Beijing doesn't, did, never, did not ever know how to run an open society. They just, they just don't have it in their DNA to trust ordinary people to make the decisions and to hold power in the way they promised in the basic law. Uh, so as, if they could keep their fingers off of it, then Hong Kong could manage it somehow, although even the Hong Kong officials are so complicit in Beijing's policies that uh, they never carried out their duty either of defending Hong Kong's autonomy. And this is why Hong Kong people have continuously demanded democracy. So Beijing's DNA, I think, gets in the way. And then what about, what about American, American policy? Taiwan in their eyes? Taiwan? And then his policy with the the United States. American. Uh, uh, so you got you got these huge international yeah. factors working that that must be affecting Xi Jinping's thinking, though. No? Yeah, in his perception, America, Britain, Western democracies are all wanting to interfere in China's internal affairs. That's their kind of constant refrain. That you know don't. In fact, we heard it from the Chinese foreign minister even today uh, that uh, accusing foreign governments who were criticizing these new democracy uh, cut backs and you know that we've already uh, uh, they're they're under attack for doing that and that this is attacked by them as being an interference in China's internal affairs. The U.S. has laws, the Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act, so we sanction people who are thought to be party to the national security law that we've discussed and are carrying it out. So each, Carrie Lam has been sanctioned. She can't, uh, any assets she have, has in the United States would be seized. Uh, and the banks, uh, she views it as a risk. She was bragging at one point that she no longer takes her salary, which is, by the way, one of the highest salaries for a political leader in the world. I think more than the US president, uh, that she takes it in cash. <laughs> so everybody was joking about her uh, the government house being full of cash under her mattress. But in any case, these <laughs> sanctioned regimes have been set up. Uh, and, and one of the things that's on the table now as this crackdown ensues further is whether there could be ways to tailor sanctions to be more effective, not just targeting a few politicians who probably don't have assets in the United States or may not care, but rather uh, including companies that are complicit in this crackdown or supporting Beijing. Because Beijing puts companies that do business in Hong Kong and China under pressure to support Beijing's policies. How much pressure can foreign governments assert that they not do that? Uh, if they do it, they do it at the risk of, of uh, you know, access to American markets and so on. So all of this is up for debate. It's, we don't know where it's going to go. So, so how likely is uh, Joe Biden, how likely is it that Joe Biden would, uh, you know, to take additional sanctions, uh, including, I suppose, uh, the Donald Trump style of trade, trade, uh, trade tariffs and sanctions? 
uh, or is he going to hang back and wait to see what happens? Well, I think he's he's he certainly seems to be indicating that he's not going to roll back the sanctions that are in place so quickly. Uh, he does take a hard line on Beijing. He disagrees with Donald Trump really in strategy, not in the, what, what what's to be achieved. Uh, so I think he he's going to hold on to his sanctions. Uh, but what he wants to do strategically is to, re, to restore U.S. alliances so that the United States is not a lone cowboy. That was kind of Donald Trump's problem. He just out there on his own, making a lot of noise, but not necessarily accomplishing much because Beijing is, the guys in Beijing are quite smart and clever. They can get around uh, a, a leadership in America that's kind of unpredictable. So there's, they, they even reach deals with the European Union on, on trade and so on in the midst of all this, which Biden didn't want Europe to do. And I think there's a lot of pressure now to stop the European Parliament from approving uh, those agreements. Mm -hmm. So the U.S. is, uh, I think, Biden, you're going to see that. Uh, there's a, a Safe Harbor Act in the U.S. Congress that I think Biden will support, which would uh, open the door to Hong Kongers to come to the United States as well, uh, refugee kind of uh, bill. Uh, so those things are going to happen. Uh, mm -hmm. And whether they will sharpen the sanctions regime, we'll have to see. Uh, one of the things that is to Biden's advantage uh, is that at least on the, their views on Trump, uh, not on Trump, on China, uh, there's agreement across the aisle in Washington that everybody is very unhappy uh, with Beijing's policies right now. And so is, 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 it, is it fair? Is it fair? I mean, you know, we talked before the show about this contention between two sides of that discussion. One is, you know, that China is essentially, um, for the future, a good partner for us. Very important. We have to maintain a good, wholesome relationship. On the other, on the other hand, uh, you know, we have a lot of people that that take uh, Donald Trump's uh, message about how China is all that, and we have to beat it up at every opportunity, and we can't have any trust relationship with it, you know, now or ever. Um, and I wonder, you know, what's what's the reality there? Is it somewhere in the middle? Uh, should we be working toward a, a more robust, a better engagement with China, or should we just be freezing them out? Well, they're both, I think, are very prominent in the debate. Uh, I think business interests may want to keep uh, things going with China, but there is some capacity in U.S. political leadership to redirect U.S. investments into other regions in Southeast Asia and so on. Uh, when it comes to things like manufacturing at low cost and, and such. So there's some of that which can be used in a kind of leveraged sort of way to try to persuade Beijing to ease off on some of these policies, which is something I think there's wide agreement on. They want, want this to happen. There are some areas where working with Beijing is more promising, like climate change, maybe dealing with North Korea, so some areas that I think uh, all sides would like to, to see still available, uh, but yet there are some really gnarly problems. I think especially with the theft of intellectual property, some of Trump's sanctions over tariffs and stuff were so out of date because uh, China's, the advantages China had set up for itself had long disappeared before Trump even got in office. So he was targeting some out of dated problems. But the one problem that he was uh, talking about at least, didn't do anything about, was these technology transfers and so on. Uh, that area I think the Biden administration is gonna want to work on as well. And I think there's a lot of agreement on China's human rights policies on both sides of the political spectrum in the US. And so uh, uh, the new secretary of state has also agreed with uh, Pompeo, the former one, uh, that uh, the, the behavior in Xinjiang, for example, can be viewed as genocide. Uh, and so uh, there, there's a hard push on that. Now, how can you use things like sanctions? You know, you might be able to use them against a very poor country, but even there, the success rate is not good. So I think there's more disagreement about how to do it than what to do. 
uh, just how can you effectively create pressure uh, that will bring uh, Beijing's behavior around to a comfortable uh, sort of. I think it's regrettable that you you know you have much, many more options if you have a multilateral uh, uh, agreement. I mean, between a number of nations that you speak up, not only on behalf of the United States, but on behalf of uh, a group of nations, all of whom uh, are led by the United States. I mean, and, and that goes to Taiwan. You started to right. talk about Taiwan a little while ago. Um, it, it strikes me that, uh, you know, unless we have a multilateral agreement of nations that want to control China's, um, you know, avariciousness, if you will, in the South China Sea and elsewhere in, in, the, in the region, um, we alone don't have that many options to stop China. Right, and, and and I think China's rise is, you know, uh, China likes to uh, describe the rise of China as going along with the decline of the U.S. I'm not sure how much the U.S. has declined. Uh, rumors of the U.S. decline have been around for decades, but it's sort of remained a very powerful country. Uh, and uh, well, hopefully its standing has not gone down. But yeah, I think working with allies in the face of the reality that China is a much more powerful country, a much wealthier country, and it has its own resources to win over uh, support for its policies. So working with others, I think, is, is really a vital part of, of what any policy direction that's likely to be more constructive. But of course, at the end of the day, you don't wanna hate China. You wanna find a way to bring it, it in and help it to understand your objections to what's going on in Xinjiang and Hong Kong. Now, the Xi Jinping hasn't been very uh, attentive to those concerns. So we don't know if it's possible to push him uh, to relax some of these things. It seems uh, very unlikely, but, but it's, it's the sort of, I think the objective that's on the table now. Well, it seems like it gets more and more interesting and if you will, more and more threatening, more challenging anyway. Yeah. And I hope you and I can, oh, yeah. we can follow it going forward. We can, I, I know there's gonna be other events that'll be a deep breathing exercise in the next weeks and months, not only about Hong Kong, but other things uh, uh, you know, emerging out of the uh, People's Congress. So uh, Michael, I hope we can circle back. There's so much more to discuss and there's so much more that will come down the pike to discuss. Absolutely. So uh, I'm always happy. Uh, as you know, I'm from over there in Hawaii. And so getting, I wish I were able to walk into your studio, but you, I can see you're in your house as well. So, so one day. <laughs> one day, one day soon, Michael. Oh, and yeah. would. <laughs> uh, Michael Davis, thank you so much for joining us again on this discussion. Aloha. Okay.